Welcome back to From Embers, a monthly show that covers anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas and practice across so-called Canada. Today we're sharing an interview I did with Jordan House and Asaf Rashid, who co-authored a book that came out last year from Fernwood Publishing called Solidarity Beyond Bars, Unionizing Prison Labor. I picked up a copy at the Halifax Anarchist Book Fair this fall and really appreciated the clarity of writing in this book. From an outline of the prison labor work picture in provincial jails and federal prisons across the country, to numerous historic examples of prisoner efforts to improve their working conditions, to advancing a fairly compelling political, moral, legal, and strategic case for prisoners' unions as a vehicle for both prison struggles and the labor movement as a whole. In this interview, we discuss the background of the book, some historic and legal precedents, the pros and cons of more legal rights-based approaches, the core strategic arguments in the book, and finally, an exciting new initiative by prisoners in Laval, Quebec to form a union. If you happen to be in Montreal this month, both authors will be presenting at a book launch and discussion at Concordia University on Friday, November 24th at 7 p.m. at the Shift Center for Social Transformation, 1400 Maisonneuve Boulevard West, room LB145. For more info on that or to obtain a copy of the book, check out fernwoodpublishing.ca. My name is Jordan House. I am a assistant professor in the Department of Labor Studies at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. <laughs> And Asif and I have known each other for a long time, which is, uh, I guess, the origins of the book. But maybe I'll let Asif introduce himself first. Yeah, so I'm uh, Asif Rashid, and I'm a criminal defense, immigration, and uh, prison lawyer in uh, Halifax, Shabuktuk. And I also was a uh, union organizer before I became a lawyer. Uh, I've been involved in a number of campaigns. I um, did my uh, dissertation, PhD dissertation work on prison labor and resistance um, in, in Canada, looking at incidents of attempts by prisoners to unionize, go on strike, that kind of thing. Um, and as of what year was it? We actually, the, the book actually kind of started on a radio show or podcast, uh, but as yeah. had a radio show in, in Fredericton, New Brunswick and invited me on to talk about my research. Uh, and several years later, we ended up uh, writing this book together. Yeah, it was 2013. Uh, I inter- was interviewing you, I think, when you were in the really early stages of like, just starting your PhD, basically. And uh, and then what uh, what happened from there is uh, uh, you kept working on your PhD, and I kept thinking about the the subject. Uh, I uh, from that point uh, on, I was involved in a couple of other union organizing campaigns, and then. Once I got into law school, I kept thinking about the subject and more the legal angle of it. And then uh, when I uh, was in my graduating year in law school in uh, 2017, I wrote a paper about the uh, subject of federal prisoners trying to unionize and what the legal case was for that. Uh, And then the idea of that paper, uh, plus the work that Jordan was already doing on his PhD, kind of morphed together into something more readable. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and I kind of wanted to acknowledge that uh, some of our listeners don't live in Canada. so And so I, I think a lot of the, especially people who are in the prison abolition context, um, I think learn primarily about the U.S. prison industrial complex and sort of an analysis of um, how that came about through Angela Davis and other writers. And I was wondering if you could just kind of highlight some of the differences uh, when we're discussing the Canadian uh, federal prison and provincial jail system from the U.S. prison industrial complex model. Yeah, I mean, this could uh, probably be its own whole conversation. But I mean, I think the the first thing to say and the most striking thing is, is obviously the Canadian system is much, much smaller, uh, you know, like an order of magnitude smaller. uh, And also the in terms of the industrial complex part of the prison industrial complex here, there are some differences. I think uh, an important thing to note is that uh, private prison management basically doesn't exist in Canada. Um, And so what we have is like a much more public uh, carceral system. Also, I think a key difference is the way that the, the provincial and federal system works here, which is not really 
the same as how the state and federal system works in the U.S. In Canada, it's very simple. People who are sentenced uh, to to uh, be incarcerated for, for two years or more uh, go in the federal system. And if they have shorter sentence than that, they are in the provincial system, along with people who are uh, on remand uh, awaiting trial. Yeah, and I think one of the... Um... One of the points that you make in your book is about the um, profit incentive not being sort of the primary driver of prison labor uh, within the Canadian system. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the I think these things could be overstated even in the in the U.S. case. The degree to which uh, you know the the prison system and prison labor in particular is shaped by like you know private employers uh, exploiting prison labor. That's definitely an element. Uh, but in the Canadian system, there's there's much less private involvement in in prison labor, and really what we have is uh, an attempt to subsidize or recuperate costs as as part of the uh, a main driving force in the logic behind uh, prison labor s- schemes. And then also in Canada, I guess because partially the system is much more centralized. Uh, there is a real emphasis on at least kind of the rhetoric of of rehabilitation uh, in Canada as opposed to to punishment, uh, which is something that actually Asif might be able to talk more about. Sure, yeah, okay, because it, it definitely will come up again. But as far as uh, is in the Canadian system, there's this big focus on this concept of rehabilitation as being basically the reason why prisoners are in prison. Supposedly, they're being uh, corrected, which is, you know, they call it the Correctional Service of Canada is, is the, the body that is uh, running federal uh, prisons. And in the provincial system, it's uh, under some body called the Ministry of Corrections or something to do with corrections. But the word correction is always in there, which is, of course, similar to the idea of rehabilitation, this whole idea where people are being fixed. So uh, prison labor in Canada is regarded as some form of something for the prisoner's own benefit. Uh, as part of general programming. So you're doing something educational or you are building something or you're cleaning a toilet or whatever. It's all considered rehabilitation as if you are the one being self-improved by what you're doing rather than doing something for the benefit of, let's say, I don't know, the prison. So uh, it's a way that the uh, prison authorities can obscure prison labor to kind of hide it in this idea that people are just being made better but no, they're not doing anything of value uh, to the prison system to uh, you know, offset our costs or anything like that. Uh, but we can get more into that later because it comes up in the, the area of uh, the legal argument for uh, prisoners being able to unionize. Right. Yeah, for sure. And just before we get to that, like, uh, I'm, I'm curious if you could kind of paint a picture of what work or labor is actually happening within Canadian jails and prisons kind of in general. What does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. There's in the book we talk about two main types of prison labor that exist uh, in Canada, but also elsewhere. The the first one is what we call institutional maintenance, which is like all the things that need to happen for a prison to function from one day to the next. So cooking, cleaning, uh, trades work, uh, you know, like uh, repair work, clerical work, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then there are prison industries, and in prison industries, goods and services are produced for sale. Um, typically uh, in Canada through something called the state use system, which means that it's the government itself and especially uh, the correctional service itself that buys most of those goods and services. Uh, but other, other you know, government agencies might also. And so uh, the major prison industries in Canada are, are agriculture, uh, construction, manufacturing, things like furniture and, and metal shops uh, and, and textile manufacturing. But there's also a whole bunch of services like auto repair, snow removal, uh, commercial laundry, printing. And then, you know, if you look at all of Canada and all of its history, prisoners have done all sorts of uh, different kinds of work, everything from like farming fish to uh, data entry and, uh, you know, operating uh, phone lines, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And in the provincial system, probably the most prominent item produced is in Ontario at the Central East Correctional Center in Lindsay, Ontario, where license plate for uh, license plate for people in Ontario are actually made at that facility. So a product that everyone has at the 
back or in front of the car, what have you, is produced in a prison. But nobody really knows that who's driving a car, uh, except those who bother to look into it. Uh, so, so there are some very prominent products like that that are produced in prisons, but that's, I guess, a rare exception. Yeah, and how does the how does the work uh, how is it gendered in terms of the in a women's prison versus a men's prison? What what are the differences in the way um, that labor is is performed? Yeah, c- critics have uh, long pointed out the ways that prison labor in Canada is gendered, and also just that women have uh, less. Uh, access to what they call employment programming, uh, which is kind of a nice way of saying prison labor. But uh, there's reasons that people want uh, jobs in prison and uh, women often, you know, have challenges finding work, which is uh, rewarding and they can learn something from. And so, you know, like uh, very stereotypically, uh, we've got textile manufacturing, typically, you know, historically women's work being concentrated in women's prisons. Uh, and things like construction and metal fabrication being in in men's prisons. And this has been heavily criticized by the uh, Office of the Correctional Investigator year after year. It's been complained about uh, year after year that uh, there is gendered uh, prison labor across Canada. It shouldn't be that way. The way that Jordan just described that uh, uh, women, uh, those in women's prisons are are effectively sewing underwear and things like that. Uh, while men are doing so-called men's work. Uh, and there's no reason why it should keep uh, going that way. It's been complained about over and over again. Nothing has changed, which is one of the running storylines uh, of prisons, of course, is that many complaints are made and nothing changes. Uh, but if prisoners unionize, this is a very winnable uh, demand uh, that uh, uh, to end uh, uh, gendered nature of uh, prison work in Canada. Yeah, and, and maybe if I could just say one more thing, the the women textile work uh, brings up one other issue, which is a common criticism of of the way that you know Asif was talking a bit earlier about how you know there's this question of rehabilitation. Who does prison labor serve? Is there is, you know are prisoners getting some benefit out of it versus the the correctional system? Um, and I think you know the textile manufacturing is a really good example uh, and has been widely criticized of. Uh, the kind of skills that people learn inside, you know, doing doing textile manufacturing uh, are not transferable to the outside in terms of of hard skills or work experience because uh, there is no textile industry effectively in Canada anymore. And this raises a whole bunch of questions uh, related to that, to the, you know, what it, what is the point of, of training people in uh, certain kinds of vocational skills if they're not going to be able to actually get jobs in that area upon release? lay out what Corcan is, what Corcan does, and, and kind of give a little bit of history and background to the to Corcan. Sure. Corcan is uh, the federal uh, organization responsible for, for prison industries. Um, and so it's the major prison industry agency in Canada. It was uh, established in the early 1980s as part of a bigger reorganization of the Correctional Service of Canada, and it was it was an attempt to centralize and modernize uh, prison prison industry. Um, in the 1990s, it became something called a special operating agency, uh, which basically meant that it was responsible to a government ministry, but had much more uh, autonomy or, or wiggle room around like budgetary items. Uh, for example, trying to maximize revenue. Um, and, and so that's the real, um, the origins of, of the current system, uh, in, in Canada, there's also, you know, kind of similar organizations at the provincial level, as I've mentioned, license plate manufacturing in, uh, in Ontario, that's, uh, overseen by a provincial body called Trilcor and some of the other Canadian provinces also, uh, have small prison, uh, industry programs. Yeah, and the, and then when I think of Corcan, I mean, I I, I think of things like um, government furniture being produced in Corcan factories, or um, hotel linens being uh, laundered, this kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely, furniture manufacturing is one of the uh, best known um, pieces of what happens to Corcan. A lot of uh, the furniture used in uh, uh, Correctional Service of Canada offices uh, are made by prisoners. Uh, as far as I know, uh, furniture may also end up in other federal government departments. 
Um, that's just one area, as Jordan mentioned. There's a number of other uh, works that happen uh, through Corcan. There, there's also the agricultural division, and uh, there's uh, metals, there's uh, construction, but uh, the furniture making is is the one, the first one I heard about. Uh, but uh, it's there's also uh, within the uh, the federal system uh, there's uh, differences in the uh, prestige of a particular job and at least theoretically these core can jobs uh, the ones where prisoners are doing so-called uh, training work that are that's getting them ready for the outside are the ones that theoretically were supposed to be the jobs that prisoners get as they're getting closer to their release. Uh, which will set them up for being able to <laughs> enter seamlessly into the outside world, which doesn't work at all, as uh, Jordan alluded to, and we'll we'll get back to that subject as well. Yeah, I I wanted uh, also to talk about the uh, role of the uh, guards unions. Um, what role do they play, kind of, in the carceral system specifically, as it relates to uh, work programs and prison labor? Yeah, so I mean. Uh... Guards are a, a force in prisons, as people can can imagine, uh, and at least in terms of uh, enforcing work discipline, there is a role that guards, as well as other staff, uh, play. So, if people have poor work performance, if people don't go to work, if prisoners decide to engage in some sort of uh, collective action, then this can bring them into into conflict uh, with the guards. And then there's you know, the, the kind of bigger issue of uh, guards unions and the roles that that, that guard unions play in uh, basically supporting and, and maintaining the, the existing carceral system, trying to expand it, uh, and also serving as a potential spoiler or, or stumbling block for prisoner organizing, including efforts by prisoners to organize around prison labor, like into prisoners unions. So yeah, there's a lot to say about guards. The history of guards and their unions, um, <laughs> I guess to, to put it, uh, to try to you know be succinct about it, has been one of, of hostility towards uh, prisoner organizing. Uh, we haven't seen much uh, worker-to-worker solidarity in this context. Yeah, the point about about guards and the role they play in, of course, in security uh, as well. Uh, there's you know, parole officers. There, there's staff that prisoners have to interact with that uh, write reports about prisoners, and those reports end up getting into uh, the parole hearings that they end up having and can determine whether that prisoner is going to be released or not. So if you have, a, let's say, a, a particular prisoner who was being treated very badly at their job and they decided uh, not to uh, show up to work because the conditions are very bad, well, you know, that ends up becoming an issue uh, for that prisoner in uh, whenever they're dealing with a parole because there will be a report saying this person didn't show up to work. And that tends to reflect badly in what's called the correctional plan uh, as far as you meeting the objective of being so-called rehabilitated uh, so that the parole board will decide that you're ready for whatever level of release you're going for, uh, possibly full release. And uh, so you can get a prisoner's work performance actually affecting their liberty. Uh, and that's how guards can you know, actually p- play a role in interfering with uh, with prisoners uh, with, you know, as far as their long-term desires to to be free. Yeah, although you, I should say that guards and guard unions also, I guess, have uh, play, play a different kind of role or have a different kind of relationship with prisons and prisoners in a certain way too, which is that Canadian guard unions are known as being quite militant uh, and emphasizing, you know, what we call in, in labor studies job control, like, uh, you know, control over and, and in the workplace. And the strength of guard unions historically uh, has served as inspiration for un- uh, for prisoners to try to form their own unions, basically saying, hey, these guys uh, are able to organize in this way and, and leverage some power. Maybe we could do that too. And so that's that's a kind of interesting way that, that guards and their unions uh, have and do interact uh, with prisoners. Yeah, I mean, I think of, I think of Kingston and 
and the presence, not of uh, maybe guards specifically, but uh, correctional employees in general, having a pretty large presence in the um, in the local labor scene. Um, and I know that's not the same. Every uh, Kingston's a prison town, right? But building off of that, what role has the broader lab- labor movement played historically, vis-a-vis prisoner organizing around work, and um, how would you like to see that evolve? Yeah, I'd say the the history is mixed at best, if not uh, much worse than that. You know, uh, in in the the very early days in, in of the industrial revolution and the development of penitentiaries, you had you know what were then you know me- working men and their organizations uh, often organizing against uh, the establishment of penitentiaries, like the one in Kingston, uh, on the basis that that they were afraid that. Uh, prison labor would undercut their wages and, and ruin them, uh, and this was done uh, in a way which which was not necessarily out of uh, humanitarian conviction or much concern for the people who would be incarcerated. Although I'm sure there was some element of that in some cases, uh, but I think that kind of economic that logic of economic competition has been the the main way that that the labor movement has interfaced with prisoners and prison labor, and so. Most of the time that that the labor movement's been involved in issues of prison labor, it is to uh, ensure that that prisoners are not getting, uh, you know, vocational skills that that will undermine wages or produce goods that will, you know, put some unionized industry uh, out of business. Um, but there there have been, you know, some moments of uh, solidarity in a few cases in in the United States of uh, unions being involved in kind of broad prison justice movement and around prisoner organizing efforts. And then in Canada, we get one very clear example in the 1970s of uh, a union called the Canadian Food and Allied Workers Union, who uh, organized a a local in uh, Ontario provincial prison uh, of, of prisoner laborers. Yeah, can 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 you talk a little bit about that? It's a very unique um, example because uh, future efforts were mostly quashed, but this one was a case where prisoners and non-prisoners working side by side were in the same union together. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Asif, do you want to talk? Yeah, sure. So it was at the Guelph Correctional Center. So this was uh, uh, in the provincial setting. And uh, it's exactly that. There is an abattoir operation uh, a private company employed both uh, prisoners and non-prisoners to work in the shop. And uh, there was a unionization campaign. And uh, as part of the like the uh, application for certification, it included both groups. Uh, there was an issue about whether uh, prisoners should be included in the same bargaining unit. And in the end, they were. They were included. Uh, the Labor Board decided that despite there being this rehabilitative character uh, to the work that prisoners were doing because the company was earning a uh, profit uh, at, that the uh, the benefit was coming to the company that the uh, prisoners should be included as employees and they were and uh, some of the gains that were made were fantastic I mean there are things that probably people would think were impossible for prisoners the the prisoners achieved wage parity with the uh, non-prisoner workers that were working beside them. Uh, they also achieved the ability to attend union meetings, which were outside the prison, of course, and the opportunity to keep their jobs upon release. And I'm sure probably no one would believe that was possible, but uh, unionization was a game changer where it uh, inherently put all these workers in the same bargaining unit. So there would be a huge issue with some workers being uh, lesser than others within the same bargaining unit when they're doing the same jobs, because that's, of course, fundamentally problematic with any uh, unionized workplace. And one of the reasons why the Labor Board decided that it was important to ensure the inclusion of prisoner workers within the same union was that if they didn't, then the prisoner workers could be used to scab against the other workers in the event of a labor disruption, which would have been a, a huge nightmare at the time. So that was one of the reasons the Labor Board saw as a policy reason for including all within the bargaining unit. And you mentioned wage parity, um, but I don't think we've we've said yet, um, what do prisoners make for their labor um, in the federal system? And this was at a, in a provincial uh, jail. So what do they make in the provincial jail in Ontario? 
So yeah, there's uh, differences in you know in all the provinces and territories in the federal system. In the federal system, there is uh, a pay scale system uh, that tops out at six dollars and ninety cents per day, uh, but then that uh, is subject to thirty percent of deductions for things like uh, room and board and uh, telephones, um, system fees, and and things of that nature. So. Um, wages are very low at the, at the top end and in the provincial system, things range from, uh, zero dollars, uh, uncompensated labor to, um, minimum wage minus deductions for people working in, uh, prison industries in Quebec. So, so earning wage parity with, with, uh, non-prisoner workers is, is a pretty huge deal in that Guelph example. Absolutely. Yeah. Compared to what's taking place today. Yeah. This was prevailing wages in, you know, the meatpacking industry, uh, in the seventies, which I don't know what the, you know, (laughs) what that was exactly off the top of my head, but it was, you know, what any, you know, uh, meatpacking worker anywhere in Ontario basically would have been making. And in many of the provincial prisons, it's, it's, uh, pretty hard to find uh, the exact details. It's, it's still a, an open investigation that uh, that we've had about what exactly the compensation is in different provincial prisons uh, for work that's being done. And uh, I mean, what we were able to, to find out, at least for the purposes of when we were writing the book, was that uh, in provincial prisons, a lot of prisoners only just get canteen credits. So the compensation is essentially next to nil. For, it's peanut uh, butter. Just, yeah, basically. literally. <laughs> yes. Peanut butter. Yeah. Bag of chips. Right. Canteen credits. Peanut butter. There's another anecdote in the book about a um, uh, a prisoners co-op that was run through the Native Brotherhood, I believe, at Edmonton Institution or Mountain Institution. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of experimentation going on. Um, some were very top down, uh, initiated and some were bottom up. And, and one of the more bottom up, uh, initiatives was, was this, uh, the native brotherhood was a organization of, uh, indigenous people in Canada. And it had, uh, some prison chapters in the seventies. Uh, and, and one of the, uh, projects initiatives that the native brotherhood launched was, uh, a workers cooperative called, uh, N E L O F native extraordinary line of furniture, uh, which made decorative furniture. Um, and the whole operation was run by the prisoners themselves with some, uh, outside, uh, support. And yeah, by, by all accounts was, was very successful. Um, everybody, including the prison administration was very happy with this example uh, it made prison administrators' lives easier because they didn't have to find these people work. It, the The organization was at least at first financially solvent, uh, but it had to deal with with uh, all sorts of bureaucratic hurdles of trying to operate a business from inside a prison. There were some issues of inside outside uh, governance, and really in in the end, who who got to make the final decisions in the organization. And then it also had to deal with uh, the competitive realities of uh, the emerging neoliberal capitalist order and trying to be a furniture business competing against, you know, the, the major, the major players. And so it uh, also kind of petered out um, sometime in the, in the eighties, I think. Um, and then I think the next example I wanted to highlight or that you highlight in the book is the, I believe it's called the Confederation attempt to unionize that was initiated at West. Uh, and I think this has become the kind of legal precedent for federal prison unions that, um, that uh, people are kind of up against. So can you explain what happened with that? Sure. Yeah. So basically in 2011 at the Mount Institution out in uh British Columbia, uh, there was uh, an attempt by uh, prisoners to unionize. And just like any unionization campaign, uh, it starts with signing up uh, fellow workers uh, by signing cards. And uh, in an effort to try to sign uh, people up on the range, uh, that effort being stopped by the authorities, uh, 
the uh, prisoners who were leading uh, the charge filed an unfair labor practice saying, well, you just stopped us from trying to organize because you prevented us from accessing uh, our fellow prisoners to sign up. Uh, that That's the basis for an unfair labor practice complaint. So that labor uh, unfair labor practice complaint was made. And in 2013, at the Public Service Labor Relations Board, a uh, case was heard uh, on this unfair labor practice complaint. And there were uh, a couple of major issues that uh, were addressed by that labor board. One was the subject of whether prisoners were actually part of the public service at all. And it was decided that they were not because they didn't exist in the public service because they were not appointed uh, by some special body. And uh, the second issue was whether uh, even if uh, prisoners were included as part of the public service, so if they, had, they were appointed and existed uh, on this list, uh, they couldn't be included anyway because they were not uh, found to be employees because they were considered to be uh, uh, basically mainly involved in a rehabilitative activity rather than uh, activity to the benefit of the employer. Uh, since then, uh, in 2015, there are a number of cases before the Supreme Court of Canada, which uh, basically may end up helping uh, federal prisoners be in a better position to unionize because there was a, a case involving RCMP employees who were officially uh, excluded from being considered employees under the Public Service Labor uh, Relations Act. Um, and that was found to be unconstitutional for those particular RCMP employees because it, it was an arbitrary exclusion of them uh, from the act. There's also uh, gig economy workers have also had some successes like food oil workers who are told you're not actually employees, you're independent contractors, but they won at the Ontario Labor Relations Board uh, because it was decided that uh, they, you know, despite uh, attempts by the employer to suggest that uh, they were independent contractors and not employees, the employer was had more control over them and the employer was benefiting so much that they were, uh, in fact, employees. So, uh, so there have been some wins uh, not from other workers that uh, could end up uh, improving the situation for uh, prisoners and workers as well as it could be a better climate now. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if that if that case working its way through in 2015, if that was the case that came out of the federal work strike in 2013. I should give some background on that in terms of the pay cuts that happened on a federal level. Um, that's when the, um, the 30% um, deductions were brought in by the Harper government as well as um, the elimination of incentive pay for working in the core can industries. So that set off um, uh, a wave of strike action, um, sort of open calls by prisoners to engage in uh, work refusals, starting in Collins Bay and other institutions around Kingston that eventually, I think through um, sort of like CBC news stories and, and contacts on the outside spread uh, across the country. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you covered uh, the basics of it. In, in 2013, the federal government, the conservative government at the time, instituted uh, pay cuts, uh, which they called room and board fees, uh, which is very disingenuous because the, the wages that were calculated in the federal wage scale at the time had already accounted for uh, room and board fees. So basically, prisoners are paying them twice, one in the sub-minimum wage that they were getting, and then after these uh, deductions went into into place on the other end too, basically as a as a as a tax on their on their earnings, um, and there was a national prison strike. Um, like you said, not particularly coordinated. It, it was about a month long, the month of uh, October 2013. In most places, some uh, institutions went out longer than than others, uh, and, and you know the strike kind of fizzled uh, fizzled out. And energies got put into a legal challenge, uh, which I think you're re referencing, which ended up being called uh, Garin, which uh, Asif could probably speak to. Yeah, Garin was actually uh, very unfortunate. It, it was uh, a pretty wholesale rejection of uh, prisoners as employees. However, uh, one thing about Garin is it did not consider... Uh, Section 2D of the Charter. So it wasn't based on a charter argument of uh, 
the right, essentially the right to freedom of association, which is, of course, uh, where you have the location of the right to unionize under that particular right. Uh, Guerin never considered that. So it wasn't a charter decision. It was a decision about whether uh, prisoners should be included as employees in order to have this this basic minimum protection. Uh, so uh, at the very least, uh, there wasn't a negative decision on uh, prisoners uh, winning the right to unionize, which is a, which is a, a separate issue. Yeah, but but on this, it's worth just putting a point on this thing once again, that the fact that the RCMP, the federal police in Canada, uh, won unionization rights may, in fact, open the door to uh, prisoner unionization. So, And, I, and I, as I like to point out, it's, it could be the, the first time that police have ever opened a door for prisoners to help them get out. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe now would be a good time to shift to the kind of the, the core argument of, of the book, because I think the book, I really appreciated how um, clear it was in, in its argument. I think the it is speaking to a few different audiences at the same time, but the case that's being made for um, normalization of prison labor and unionization is, is quite uh, clearly made. So I'm wondering if you could just sort of lay out your, your key argument that you're making. Yeah, we had this b- debate about whether to use the word normalization, and and uh, we ended up going with it. Uh, and by that, we don't mean that just prison labor should be uh, a normal thing. Um, we probably could have went with the word regularization in that what we're talking about is that there's no <laughs> reasonable public safety or other justification for prisoners to be excluded from the normal employment standards, occupational health and safety regulations, or labor laws that other people who work in Canada uh, are, are protected by. Well, I was going to say, we also make the case that I think this this demand for normalization is strategic in a few key ways. Uh, one, it's strategic in that we argue we, a, a broad coalition could be, could be built around this demand. You got the labor movement who should be interested in workers' rights, you've got the prison justice, prison abolition movement. You have, uh, you know, civil libertarians uh, and others who, who I think could be could be convinced of this of this argument. Uh, but then, moreover, we get the we we argue that there's a particularly strategic approach to to n- normalization in that it creates opportunities for further reforms and demands to be to be uh argued for and 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 unionization being the key one as far as the strategic part of it goes uh there's there's something to it uh where uh when we're talking about uh uh essentially like a non-reformist reform which is one one of the other terms we use in the book and many others use it in, in their books and articles and what have you, is that it's it's the kind of change that's transformative. And the reason for that is uh, unionization brings into play the bargaining table. And prisoners don't have that bargaining table. They Yeah, they have inmate committees, which have zero power, really. Uh, prisoners uh, don't have any real leverage inside prisons to make any changes. That's why you don't really see any any changes happening in prisons. In fact, you're seeing things get much worse over time. More and more prisoners are ending up in solitary confinement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but when you put in play this bargaining table, uh, there are certain a certain bundle of rights that automatically come into play, which have been won over time by workers fighting and fighting to increase the bundle of rights that they have. So you can compel the employer. In this case, it's the employer slash jailer for prisoners uh, to have to come to the bargaining table and negotiate over work-related demands. But guess what? In prisons, it's not just about uh, your work. It's about your living environment because it's the same place. So what about uh, the quality of the air? Well, that relates to in your cell as well as the rest of the prison, including your work environment. Another issue is grievances. The grievance system in prison it's completely dysfunctional. Those are my words. Those are the words of the correctional investigator. Prisoners make grievances about mistreatment 
in various ways uh, about, uh, you know, not being able to talk to their lawyer, about not getting disclosure of materials that they need for a particular hearing and work-related concerns being un- unfairly dismissed from their prison jobs, whatever. And then it takes forever to deal with these grievances and often they're rejected. And it's so far down the road that it's no longer meaningful. It's a totally useless system in many ways. And But with an actual... A grievance system that is part of labor arbitration over uh, prisoners' labor conditions, which you know, if, if they can negotiate, they could also bring in some prison conditions into the onto the table as well. There, there is a particular grievance procedure that would be dealt with outside of prison by a labor board. So it's it's one that is more robust. And many people can complain about labor boards across the country, but they're definitely not as bad as as the grievance system that prisoners have to deal with. Uh, so it would it would be substantial improvements that would shift power dynamics in a fundamental way to force the employer uh, to have to do things they don't want to do. Yeah, I think the argument that um, uh, some kind of prisoners organization, whether that be a union or uh, otherwise, um, sort of becoming a vehicle for for a number of struggles around a number of different conditions because everything's kind of linked in the in the prison. Uh, and it wouldn't just be about, yeah, your work assignment or something like that. It's, it, it would, it would include kind of a more holistic approach to things, uh, is, is it's a compelling argument. You mentioned the non-reformist sort of reform approach to that. And, and given that most of our listeners on this show are going to be anarchists, anti-authoritarians and abolitionists, um, how do you see that relating to those projects that are, uh, about abolishing prisons ultimately? Yeah, I mean, I think we make the case in the book that a union for prisoners creates a real base of power. And despite the fact that, you know, labor law is imperfect, uh, what a prisoner union has uh, to its advantage is that there are protections for unions from employer interference in the law. It is an unfair labor practice to meddle in the internal affairs uh, of of the union. And this is completely you know, unlike uh, inmate committees or other forms of, of prisoner organization. Uh, but more importantly than than that, and the kind of legal structure that, that we've already discussed, I think is the fact that what a union does is it, it formalizes uh, prisoners' uh, economic power. We've already talked a little bit about the ways that prison labor is essential to the prison. We didn't, we didn't come up with this idea. Prisoners have long understood this and, and utilized, you know, uh, strikes and, and other forms of protests around work and to, you know, leverage, uh, demands, uh, and concessions and then also be a way for prisoners to interface, uh, with, with the broader labor movement and try to have a voice, uh, you know, in, in a larger kind of transformative working class uh, movement as much as, as that exists. And also we, you know, we talk in the book uh, a lot about the deficiencies of labor and the need for there to be, uh, you know, a real uh, transformation of, of the labor movement into something which is actually capable of making gains for, for the working class broadly uh, and not just little groups of, of workers here and there. Yeah, definitely. When it comes to the to the labor movement, a lot is potential. A lot of what we're talking about is what we'd like to see and what many would like to see, which is a, a truly inclusive labor movement that includes the those in, in the working class who we include prisoners, of course, in that working class. Uh, but, but the labor movement should should have a, a you know broader inclusion of of all people in the working class uh, to be a more representative movement with with far more power. And with such a movement, you know, ideally you have this this larger and, and growing, much more powerful labor movement uh, that prisoners are a part of. And then prisoners would have a gateway outside of prison uh, to communicate their issues. Right now, that is huge difficulty that prisoners have. There's all kinds of terrible things that happen in prisons all the time. So many people across the country right now are in solitary confinement. We hear about maybe 0.1% of them. And we often hear about uh, the horrible conditions someone endured once there's a lawsuit or when someone dies in prison. It's like the most horrible conditions and you hear about it through the media. But uh, through uh, a prisoner's union, if prisoners are unionized, part of a broader labor movement, uh, whenever there are issues that arise about uh, poor conditions, poor working conditions, poor prison conditions, there will be an avenue to get the word out uh, much more broadly and much more often, which which is very powerful. It's removing the darkness uh, uh, that exists and, 
within prisons. And I mean, anytime people are in prison, you can't, they can't like uh, extricate the darkness, not truly, but, but you can at least like shine a bit more light in there so that it's possible, possible to make at least some more changes. What about, you brought up inmate committees and, and I, my mind did keep going back to inmate committees while I was reading the book. And my understanding of the history of inmate committees is they came out of the um, the sort of period of uprisings in the 1970s that were happening, uh, as well as the restructuring of the federal prison system. And one of the kind of concessions of the government, the federal government, after uh, the unrest of the 70s was to uh, give prisoners this organization, the inmate committee, which is kind of widely understood to be... Um, I mean, it varies from institution to institution, but it's it's largely co-opted and, and is a very difficult position for a prisoner to take on. And, and I'm wondering how you could imagine a, a union um, uh, performing this function in a more effective, uh, more democratic, more uh, militant way than, than what's become of the inmate committees. Yeah, uh, I think it's important to note that, the, you know, the inmate committees were explicitly set up to be consultative bodies with no independent independent power and and along with the the inmate committees in the 70s uh were grievance systems which i think asif's already kind of talked about which were which were modeled after the grievance procedures uh in in you know labor you know employee employer uh relations but i think you know I, i've heard people refer to uh in inmate committees as basically like uh student government but but you know instead of being in high school for four years you're in prison for for much longer unions are also more or less democratic more or less militant and it is up to uh the the members of those organizations to to shape to shape them uh and i think you know asif and i both come come out of uh labor at least partially uh and it is uh, important that uh, organizers fight for uh, real independent organizations, which which will be able to to stand up to uh, administrators and the government and and fight for the interests of of prisoners. And we, I think, if you know, you look at the history of prisoner activism, I'm I'm fairly optimistic about about this point that prisoners are extremely capable. Uh, and extremely militant and willing to to fight for uh, their rights and, and and their interests, and so I think that uh, the a prisoners' union could be this vehicle that that you mentioned earlier to uh, you know advancing the power and interests of prisoners in a different kind of way than than anything that's uh, existed so far. Yeah, and, and definitely a huge difference between the the inmate committee and if uh, prisoners uh, formed a, a you know a union local is that union local has is a certain standing that uh, there is no choice but to have to negotiate with them. Inmate committees have no such power. It, there's there's no uh, obligation whatsoever of the prison administration to negotiate with the inmate committee. Um, you know they they can. Uh, they can come up with a list of demands and that list of demands can simply go to the shredder and, and there's nothing to it. Uh, so there's quite a huge difference in, in considering what the value of the NMA committee is versus a, a union local. And that's not to, to dismiss uh, that NMA committees can be very valuable as vehicles to which prisoners can communicate issues to the administration. I don't want to diminish that at all, but there's a huge, huge difference in, in power between uh, the idea of an in, between the inmate committee and uh, a union local for sure. Is there not a perspective out there also that the like legalization and labor law weakened unions more than it actually, like I understand the point you're making about the legal protections being um, necess- especially in a prison context, how it could really change the game for what prisoners could accomplish. But is there not also a, an argument to be made that labor law was sort of written to to limit the the potential of what unions could achieve sort of on a revolutionary basis yes absolutely and uh in in almost any other context i would uh make that point very strongly but i think what you know asif has been talking about and what prisoners have 
advocated for is is a very smart strategy of trying to leverage one set of rights by claiming rights as workers against the prerogative and authority of of prison administrators. Uh, and as long as that exists as a avenue for for struggle, uh, I think it's a smart one to to take up. It does not, you know, negate the the necessity to have, you know, uh, a kind of organization that has real deep relationships, which has real capacities uh, to organize and fight. Uh, but I think as as long as those structures exist in the prison context uh, is where they're, the, they're, you know, the most important to try to leverage. And I think if you look at the, the history of, la- you know, labor history, there's been an attempt to balance uh, by labor activists, basically the need to be in continuous mobilizing mode uh, and continuous struggle, which has costs, uh, and, and to try to eke out some stability um, and, you know, a temporary, uh, pause in, in the, the, you know, highest form of, or the most open form of, of conflict. And I, you know, I agree very much with your assessment that ultimately, uh, the labor movement is in the conundrum that it's in because it relied far too much on those structures and not enough on, uh, its own, you know, power and economic and leveraging economic power. Uh, but th- this is something, you know, that we we openly say we grapple with in, in the book. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, too, to look at. I mean, this is a whole other subject, I'm sure, for probably a whole podcast series where uh, the the subject of uh, where where things may have gone downhill for the labor movement in terms of militancy. A lot of the, the really powerful uh, labor struggles of the past were actually to win recognition. Uh, to win certain rights, but but then when certain bundles of rights were achieved, uh, then you had uh, labor leadership perhaps uh, sit uh, sit on those rights, and uh, there wasn't this ongoing effort to to uh, continue to engage rank and file workers to have uh, rank and file led unions that would continue to push and push and push. Um, but but certain there were certain concessions. Uh, that were made over time that you could say likely severely weakened labor movements, such as uh, uh, limiting the strike window and things like a cooling off period and uh, a lot of uh, harsh sanctions for any action, uh, labor action that takes place outside of the narrow strike window, things like that. So there are certain concessions that uh, you can argue definitely uh, weaken uh, militancy for sure. But then Others like such as even just union recognition, you know, whether whether that is is something that actually, you know, did weaken uh, the labor movement in terms of militancy or not. Uh, maybe that that was a good thing and still is a good thing uh, and, and didn't actually reduce uh, any power of rank and file workers. Um, are you are, do you follow the um, incarcerated workers organizing committee stuff um, primarily in the U.S. that's been through the industrial Workers of the world, and uh, how, yeah, what's sort of your take on that model as it relates to your case for a prisoner's union in Canada? Yeah, so I mean, that is an interesting example given the conversation we were just having because uh, the legal landscape in the US is quite different. And there was an attempt uh, in North Carolina to form a prisoner's union that eventually uh, the case worked its way up to the US Supreme Court in 1977. And there was a decision, uh, Jones v. North Carolina Prisoners Union, that found that that in the United States, prisoners do not have a constitutional right uh, to join or form a union. Uh, and so that really uh, posed a major challenge and, and kind of resulted in the decline of unionization as a, as a main current within the prisoners movement in the U.S. And I think what is interesting about the IWW and, and IWOC uh, is that they are trying to uh, adopt, you know, what the IWW calls solidarity unionism, which is basically just, you know, worker direct action without the need for this kind of legal certification and formal collective bargaining that we've just been talking about 
and apply it to the prison context. And, and you know, and the IWW and IWOC didn't make this up either. They were uh, inspired by uh, prisoners who were basically already advocating this position, in particular um, in Alabama in the early 20 teens. Um, and yeah, and I think we've seen uh, some really uh, incredible organizing and, and some uh, really uh, inspiring uh, moments of, of protest and revolt. And the, there were, you know, national prison strikes in the United States in, uh, was it 2016 and 2018, if I'm not mistaken. And these were big and really put, put prison labor and incarceration in the United States on the public, uh, agenda in, in a way that I think is, you know, quite unusual, rarely spoken about. Uh, however, also related to our, the conversation that we were just having, I think it is exhausting to be constantly mobilizing like this. And there are real costs. And the organizers of those strikes uh, did face, you know, huge amounts of uh, repression. And so I think it's, it's yet to be seen uh, if uh, prisoners and prison organizers in the United States are going to be able to... Uh, you know, continue to escalate um, and and push this strategy for uh, a nationwide prison strike that would that would shut down American prisons. And you know, I think I think that could happen. I think it would be incredible if it happened, uh, but not an easy task, obviously. And so, where where are things at right now in terms of is there an effort, like an ongoing effort, right now by? prisoners in Canada to form a union? Um, what, what is sort of the picture of this right now? And, and where could people um, find these real existing projects to kind of learn more about them? Right. So there, there is one ongoing effort right now. It's at the Federal Training Center in Laval, uh, Quebec. So that's a federal prison, federal training center. And uh Prisoners uh, who work in that institution uh, began an effort uh, to organize some months ago, and uh, not surprisingly, they faced opposition from the uh, administration, and they filed an unfair labor practice complaint, and now that's working its way forward. So an effort has been launched, and a legal challenge has been launched, so uh, it's back. Uh, the The struggle of, of uh, prisoners to try to unionize is a present struggle right now. And uh, we only expect it to uh, grow bigger over time. That I'm surprised to hear that. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Is that yeah. like breaking news? Uh, pretty close. Yeah. Is it uh, it's, it's recently. So it's a continuation of the Confederation attempt from, from the, you know, uh, a bit more than a decade ago. Uh, and my understanding is that a, a network of uh, organizers and sympathizers uh, continues to exist, uh, but the uh, campaign is very much kind of being built around a, a strategic kind of legal uh, approach. And so the idea is to uh, see what happens with this uh, unfair labor practice. And then uh, there'll be some kind of determination about how to proceed on the on the organizing front. So these these legal processes are slow. I don't know exactly. Uh, what to expect, but but yeah, stuff is in the works. Well, I guess I could say that uh, the legal effort is being uh, headed up by a lawyer uh, who's based in Toronto named uh, Ryan White, and he is at the firm. Uh, his law firm is called Cavaluzzo, and so uh, if if people uh, are in touch with people inside who are interested in this and want to get more information, uh, he, that would be the person to reach out to. Okay, and now that the the book is out, it's been out for a year. I actually um, just picked it up at the Halifax Book Fair in September. Um, but uh, now that it's out, are you? What are you doing to kind of continue that conversation? Well, I think we've been feeling uh, very uh, lucky to get to uh, talk to the book about uh, you know and about these issues to so many people and and you know like you said earlier we've really the book is is targeted at a few different audiences um, prison abolitionists prison justice activists 
but also the labor movement. And we've had we've had the opportunity to sit in rooms with with prison abolitionists and trade unionists and and talk about this and start to uh, see what kind of um, reaction there would be to the next time that you know an organizing campaign uh, picks up steam. And you know I feel uh, quite optimistic that unlike in 2011 when confederation kind of like hit the news these prisoners are trying to to unionize and this was understood to be kind of like a curiosity and the labor movement didn't say anything about it uh, i do feel like that there is a much better uh environment and and potential support network that exists now uh compared to last time yeah no no definitely and, and as far as the the book uh goes it's um we're almost nearing our one year anniversary of publication. And, uh, you know, so far it feels like, uh, at least to me that uh, key momentum may be actually just building right now. It's like, you know, there, there's been a number of events over the last year, but now with, with, a you know, a live issue on the ground of, uh, uh, you know, prisoners unionizing and the prospect for, uh, more prisoners to to join in and and it, for it to become uh, you know a, a bigger uh, essentially a, a bigger effort. Uh, it's it feels like the the content of the book is kind of jumping off the page now and uh, it's more meaningful. Uh, and you know that was one of our hopes in writing the book and publishing it was that it would become a useful book. Uh, for helping further efforts that the book talks about and discusses. It's kind of part of an overall conversation of something that's happening. Uh, and, you know, it kind of feels like, you know, at least it, it is playing a part or it's uh, at least one of the little pieces that, that exists within the broader kind of tapestry of what's happening. Um, and if people are listening and they want to plug into this organizing, do you have any suggestions for where to start? I mean, if people are in unions, Asif and I have been talking about this, we really think that, uh, you know, a key thing is to start talking to coworkers, talking to people in your union local, and to start to put the issue of prison labor on the agenda of labor in a way where, uh, you know, that kind of network uh, for support and solidarity can be built. And we think that that is, is really key. If you aren't in a union, and you are doing prison justice organizing. Uh, we think that you know the the labor angle is is an important one. One of the issues with with you know people will know doing any kind of work around prisons in Canada and other places is that there's so much you know uh, censorship. Uh, it's so hard to get information, and so just talking to people about their experiences working inside and collecting that information is also, I think, a pretty key thing. Yeah, and just quickly about the uh, the subject of talking to your, your union locals, uh, why that's so important. Even if there is an effort led by Confederation, which is a, a by prisoners for a prisoners labor union, uh, that uh, union uh, cannot actually be in a good position for success without support of the labor movement. They're going to need resources, and having uh, more union locals, uh, having labor movement as a whole being very interested in supporting the ongoing effort of prisoners uh, through providing funds, through providing other support, logistical support, what, what have you, uh, will be crucial for uh, the eventual victory of prisoners. Uh, so th- having the labor movement factor in and the way to do that, of course, is uh, is getting the locals to, to mention it uh, and bringing it to conventions and, and getting uh, support for launching resources into, into the struggle that will all be necessary.
Join us for Kite Line, a weekly radio program on Channel Zero Network that focuses on issues in the prison system. With over 50 episodes already released, you can hear informative and riveting stories about the impact of prisons on people both inside and outside of the prison walls and how they fight back. Kite Line is intended as means of communication between people across prison walls. Our goal at Kite Line is to amplify the voices of those within the prison system while encouraging dialogue with those on the outside. Hear us on the Channel Zero network and visit our website for more information or previous episodes at kitelineradio.noblogs.org.